Welcome to Witch Hunt. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. Today, we're discussing a critical issue affecting children in parts of Africa, accusations of witchcraft. While many might think witch hunts are a thing of the past, the reality is that they're still happening today with some of the most vulnerable members of society as their targets. We're joined by Carolyn Judd, a lawyer and chair of the Stop Child Witch Accusations Coalition. Carolyn brings years of experience working to protect children from these harmful accusations and violence that often follows. In this episode, we'll explore the complex factors behind child witch accusations, from poverty and fear to misunderstandings about child development. We'll also learn about the innovative approaches Carolyn's coalition is using to address this issue, including community education and faith-based initiatives. Carolyn's insights offer a beacon of hope in addressing this challenging problem. Her work shows how education and compassion can transform communities and protect children. So join us for this eye-opening conversation about a modern-day witch hunt crisis and the efforts to stop it. Let's get started. Welcome to Witch Hunt Podcast. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us about your background? Hello, my name's Carolyn Gent. I'm speaking from the UK where I am the chair of the Stop Child Witch Accusations Coalition. My background is that I have, I'm a trained lawyer and a trained teacher, and I've worked for many years in both of those in, uh, contexts. And I've been working in the charitable sector for the last uh, 15 years or so, and specifically with, on the issue of child witch accusations for about a decade and a bit. Stop Child Witch Accusations is a coalition that was formed in about 2012 to provide a specifically Christian response to the issue of child witch accusations, because we had discovered through the work of, of one of the organizations that's part of that coalition, that many of the children on the street, living on the streets of Kinshasa, where we were working at the time, were there because of accusation. And who are the children that you work with and why are they displaced? The coalition is basically a group of organizations that work through church. There are organizations and individuals who've come together with a particular heart for this issue. And so the people that we work with on the ground are the connections of those various partner organizations that are part of the coalition. So we work in primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, in nations which are epicenters for this form of child abuse. Our work is specifically for working on the prevention of accusations made against children and the related harm that's connected with that. But actually much of what we do relates equally to adults who are accused of being witches too and the harm that they suffer. So we work um, with partners who are uh, church or parachurch organizations or church connected organizations, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Nigeria, in Togo, in parts of Kenya. And we have connections also in, in Tanzania and elsewhere in other sub Saharan African nations where this is a problem. What do you do to assist the accused? Our work is basically to do with training church leaders and that it's extended beyond that. But it's let's start with where we began, which was working through churches. We recognize that churches were implicated in the problem of accusations in the nations where we're working. But also it was really clear that many churches either were already or had the potential to be a real force for good in challenging um, accusations in their community. Churches have enormous influence in the nations where we're working, and you'll find that there are churches on every corner. There are many of them. And what we wanted to do was to engage with churches, to equip them with training and with a response, how, uh, lessons in how to respond to uh, accusations so that they could then change attitudes and thinking within their own communities, within their congregations and directly to change the, the way that they were dealing with children who were accused. We don't, we're not a rescue organization. We don't have that kind of resourcing. 
But what we have found is that through training churches, church leaders themselves become rescuers of children. So it's quite common for church leaders who've received this training to become passionate advocates for children, including taking them into their own homes um, on a fostering basis where they've been rejected or thrown onto the street. So um, our work is kind of in the background. We, we, pro pro we have created the training resources that are used and we provide a certain amount of resources for, uh, uh, to enable churches to, to be trained in the materials that we've created. Uh, but we are not directly working on the ground in the nations where we're represented because that's far less effective. It's much better for things to be peer-to-peer uh, not to be a whole load of white faces going in from um, what can appear to be a, a rather um, colonial, have echoes of colonialism, and that's to be avoided at all costs. So we work um, on the enabling of local partners um, so that they can do the work on the ground with the children. Um, and I've realized I didn't mention why some of the children are accused. Of, there are multiple reasons. It's a very complex issue. It's a very nuanced issue and it's um, not helpful if it's reduced. If, if, we take, if you take a very reductive approach to what's happening, that is actually missing much of what's going on, much of the complexity of what's going on. But the major drivers for accusations are, they're multiple, but there's firstly a, a negative attitude towards children in general. Children are perceived as lesser members of society. Sometimes there's fear of children where children have become child soldiers, where they are living on the streets and can be quite violent. They can be parts of violent gangs. So the notion of children as innocent or to be protected or nurtured has been eroded in many of the places where child witch accusations are rife. Another root cause is a total misunderstandings around child development, normal child development and particularly the impact of trauma on children. So why a child, for example, might become either aggressive or regressive in some ways, or might uh, wet the bed out of the normal sort of age expectations. That type of thing can be misinterpreted as being a sign that child is a witch. A third problem is the whole issue around personal responsibility and scapegoating others for misfortune. So. It's quite common in the contexts where we're working for people to ask the question, who did this to me, rather than why did this happen when things go wrong, whether that might be a sickness, a death, a loss of a job, an infertility, something like that. So there's always a desire to find a person to blame. And the tendency is to blame those who are least able to protect themselves, which tends to be the children or the elderly. Another reason is that these communities, many of these communities are very fear driven. There's a lot of fear in communities, fear, particularly fear of spiritual forces. And that's, they live, people are living, the children in particular are living in communities which are spiritually very complex. There may be a mixture of traditional beliefs. Some, in some places like in Toga, there's voodoo beliefs. Then you may have animism and those types of beliefs. Uh, meshed with Christianity and or versions of Christianity and other religions. And it creates a kind of melting pot where people are often seeking a spiritual explanation for a physical or tangible problem. And that takes the form of trying to blame a person for whatever has happened. So that's another major driver. And then that all of this is exacerbated by grinding poverty. There is uh, where people live in an atmosphere of grinding poverty, where they have very few options in life. It's quite common for people to seek an explanation for what is going on in their world. Why is this happening to me? What's, what's, uh, why should it be? Why can't I have what others have? Um, and that can create, um, lead to the creation of a worldview where things are explained through a spiritual prism. Um, and that is often um, witchcraft belief driven or informed. So that's just a, that's a, a part of what we're doing. So what we've created is training resources that address of those root causes. So we've looked at those, we've broken it down into seven root 
causes or root areas. And then we've created a training resource, which is a modular training resource to deal with each of those issues. I'm curious, do, does the training help the faith organizations engage with their local government or police on the matters as well? Yes, or- it, does, it does in places. We started off without that expectation. We started off purely with materials that were both research-driven and biblically underpinned so that there was a common language that, that we could use with the church leaders. And that was who we were targeting with the training in the first instance. And what has happened quite organically in the areas where we've been working is it happened both ways around. We've had incidences where there's been a training that's been arranged for some, for some church leaders and local health workers or local authority workers or the police have asked to be involved in that training. They've been interested in what's going on and have asked to be involved. And that's happened on, in, in one direction. And then in the other direction, and the local partners that we're working with have organically, and with that, not at our suggestion, but organically have thought, we need to take this into schools. We need to take this into uh, other forums so that uh, others are, in, are involved too. And one of the most encouraging things that's happened has actually been in, in Goma, in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, where over the course of, of a few years, it started really in about, 20, about 2017, 2018, um, they were piloting the heart of the matter, which is the name of our training resource. And then it was systematically training churches and then taking it into schools as well. And the impact was such that the local authorities and the police in particular became very interested in what was going on and have asked to be trained as well. And what has grown out of that is things that are called on, in the local context, they're called synergies, which are formal collaborations between trained churches, our partner organization there, and the local police and local authorities and some NGOs that are working in that area, particularly with the human rights agenda. And they are now working together with formal written understanding and agreements between them to tackle child abuse generally in those areas, but specifically to challenge child witch accusations with the result that perpetrators have been been brought to justice and also children have been rescued by local churches in particular to, to give them safety. So that's, but that's happened almost without totally unexpectedly and rather wonderfully. So it's just, it's, it means that it can engage the local authorities, the, the, the approach can engage the local authority. It's brilliant that this coalition has come together and is taking the approach that you spoke of to address the root causes mm -hmm. rather than just the symptoms. We've heard that a holistic approach is what's needed. Can you explain why that's such an approach is necessary and uh, what might that involve? Yeah. Um, well, the important thing is not to be, not to start from a confrontational perspective. What we realized very early on was that simply going and telling people not to do what they're doing has zero impact. People simply resent being told, particularly by outsiders, that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. And Equally, you can get a situation, even education uh, in inverted commas of itself isn't enough because people can parrot the correct response to, a, to something without it changing their behavior. So what we have recognized is that what you need to do is create a forum where people can reflect on their own beliefs and practices, reflect on their own communities and how they want their communities to be. And it's only then that you can start to, to get people to question, why, do, why does this happen here? Is this a good thing? Is this how we would like our community to be? Are the consequences of what's happening positive or negative for our children, for our families, for our community, for our society as a whole? And so if you can get people to start reflecting like that, then they begin to own a change in approach and a change in, in practice. And that has a significant impact. When, you, when people start to model that change, 
that is contagious. And so you can start to impact the way that the authorities respond, or as in the case of Goma, the way the police respond to a particular situation. Or the local community leaders will start to say, this is not to happen in our community. We're not going to do that here. And that is contagious. And we believe that in order to create that kind of momentum for change, you need to allow people the space and the safety, in inverted commas, to reflect on their, their own beliefs and practices. And it's the kind of guided way of doing that. It's respectful and it participative rather than being somebody trying to tell others what they should and shouldn't do. Equally along there and parallel to that, they, there's enormous value in legislation and in changes at the sort of top down level. But we are aware, hugely aware that even in a country like DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is an epicenter for abuse, there is already legislation that says accusations of witchcraft are not permitted. And that's been around since 2009. And we know jolly well that most people, A, don't know about it, and B, that it is virtually never enforced. So although it is a useful tool, it's not enough on its own. And neither is it enough simply to get people to parrot an acceptable response to the whole issue. You have to let people take it in internally process what they're thinking and change that from within almost, rather than simply being told from outside that something is or is not acceptable. I can really see where when the crisis is recognized and the wish to find a problem is recognized on a personal level or by an organization and a group in their own in a unified way, how mm -hmm. that can drive collaboration mm -hmm. out of their organization to the other pieces of the community where I know we see around us in this world, there's lots of things that different organizations and government aren't able to come together on because there's these barriers. Maybe it's belief or money or misunderstandings or any reason. But when they're like, we don't want this here and how that can ripple out. That's really impressive. And yeah, I just, I really see that happening mm -hmm. in what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. We've, we have evidence that there is genuine impact and that it's lasting impact. So we're, what we, what is happening in the communities where we're working, obviously we're working in a small number of communities relative to the to kind of scale of the problem globally. But where our partners are, are working on this, it is changing things and it's changing things in a long lasting way, which is what you want, because otherwise nothing will change. And unless people's thinking changes permanently and they become more questioning of, of accusations and of the harm that, that's done to people through those accusations, then that's not, it's not going to stop. And it's certainly not going to stop just because people are telling them they shouldn't do it. Um, so, so we 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 feel that it is a it is an effective approach. We always say it's a marathon, not a sprint. You don't get overnight results. It's not like digging a water hole, a borehole in a community, and before nobody had any water, and now lots of people have water. It, it doesn't work like that. And it is much harder to quantify change because a there are virtually no official statistics for the numbers of people that are accused of being witches or of the harm that's done to them. And it's one of those unusual phenomena that is hidden in plain sight. So it happens with impunity, but a lot of people, it's very rarely talked about and, and a lot of people from outside never see it and, and people won't tell an outsider what's going on in that community. So it's possible for a development organization to work in a, a, a context where uh, witchcraft accusations are actually endemic and happening a lot um, and be completely oblivious to them because of the, the nature of the of what's going on. Um, so it is really important that people are, that's why peer-to-peer -peer works better when you've got the local church or the local leaders are, are the ones that are driving the work on the ground. That is far more effective than people coming in from outside and telling them what they should or should not be doing. 
I can definitely see how meeting people where they're at mm -hmm. is definitely beneficial than trying to come to them from the outside. And yeah. I suppose that's where meeting them spiritually mm -hmm. uh, on the same level, something they understand the Bible um, yeah. helps with that uh, yeah. connection. Yeah. And the Bible is so clear in its teaching about um, the fact that Christians have a responsibility to the ones that are pushed to the margins of society. And that is, uh, that it runs right through the Old and the New Testament. It's so clear. And the model that Jesus Christ presented of loving and caring for children and prioritizing them over adults, in fact, so getting very angry when people try to drive children away. If you can, cre if you can um, emphasize those two things in a community and say, look, this is what we say we believe. This is what we say that we hold these values, but this is what we're actually doing. How can we make what we're actually doing conform more closely to the values that we profess to hold and that to the model that, that the, but the biblical model and the model specifically the model that Jesus said. And that is an incredibly powerful approach. And people get that very quickly, um, particularly in a context where Christianity is perceived to be authoritative and where the Bible is perceived to be authoritative. So that's one of the reasons why we found that it's so effective to work through church. And as you said, the peer to peer, they feel the right to have those conversations with each exactly. other. Exactly. That's exactly right. And a church leader can stand in front of a congregation, which will be often several hundred people, if not more. And as a percentage of the population, of the local population, many, many people will be involved with the church. And so if you can get the church leaders to be firstly teaching what the Bible actually requires of Christians in terms of child protection and of upholding the, the advocating for those who are on the margin. And then not only do that, but model it. So take children into their homes, eat with children, because there are so many beliefs around witchcraft being transferred from one place to another through food. So if a church leader will eat with a child that's been accused of being a witch, that is an incredibly powerful message in the community. And you can get to the stage where you can get a whole congregation that will stand against this particular practice. So we had a story recently that came in from our team, the team that we're working with in Calabar in Nigeria, which is a, an, another epicenter for accusations. And one of the pastors who'd gone through the training, the Heart of the Matter training, and has become since become really active in in teaching his his church congregation and his wider community the core messages from from the the teaching. Um, he, there was a visiting um, preacher who came to that to, into his church, who um, unexpectedly, I think, started to say started to advocate for um, a very violent anti witch in inverted commas. Um, action and the entire congregation refused to do that which totally disempowered that that particular man and created an extraordinarily strong message no this is not in not on our watch not in our name not in our place and that is a very powerful way of impacting a community and then you get a rippling out from that it's a bit like a, the old cliche of the stone in the pool with the ripples of the water going out from the center. And that is exactly what does happen. So you're going to be speaking at a conference in Lancaster, the Witchcraft and Human Rights Conference. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little about that conference and what you'll be speaking on? Sure. Um, well, going back a little bit, there's long been advocacy at United Nations level for a resolution calling for the elimination of wit uh, witchcraft accusations and harmful rituals, effectively, for the harm that's caused by those things, particularly relating to people with albinism, but also witchcraft accusations, which are which tend to be um, targeted against different groups. And that resolution was finally passed um, 
a couple of years ago and has been adopted by the Pan-African Parliament and they've issued guidelines for its implementation. And the conference, the, the people that are meeting at the conference are various individuals and organizations that have been involved in that advocacy work at United Nations level and who are now looking at how that resolution can be or how governments in places where accusations and, and ritual attacks happen can be encouraged to put that resolution into practice. And I'm actually talking and with my colleague about some research that we're doing into children's experience of accusations. What we're looking at particularly is why do children accuse other children? And how can we produce some resources that would work with children and for children? to help children to examine their own thinking around accusations and to try and cut off that intergenerational transfer of harmful beliefs. So we've been doing some research around that, clearly that if we can create uh, resources that are effective with children and change that sort of intergenerational uh, story, that is one very powerful way that witchcraft accusations over time will diminish and be, and, and could be that material or that approach could be adopted at a, a more official level in order to try to cut down that intergenerational transfer of harmful beliefs and practices. So we've been doing some research into how children experience these things, what they think about, about witchcraft and about people who are accused of being witches. So we've been doing some with some teams in Calabar, in Goma, and in Kenya. We've been doing some semi-structured interviews through our partners there to to just talk to children about what do they about their communities, what do they like and dislike about their communities, what is their understanding of what a witch is, what happens if they in, in their community if someone is accused of being a witch, who's accusing them. Do children in their community accuse other children and so on? But it's, the, the questions are, are fairly open and children have the opportunity to talk about what they want to talk about in that context. And we're getting the first results in from that research, which is very, very interesting indeed. And the, the results that they're, of that research are basically what we're going to be, the preliminary results are what we're going to be presenting in Lancaster. So the idea is to explain the methodology, explain why we're doing what we're doing, explain the approach, which you have to be super careful when you're talking to children about these things, because A, you don't want to traumatize them in any way. And if a child has experienced an accusation directly or indirectly, then that is clearly a traumatic experience and you don't want to do anything that's re-traumatizing. And they need to be being spoken to by, with adults who are experienced at working with children so they know how to how to talk to children in a way that is in kind of conforms to general child protection principles and ethical standards and also with permission from parents and guardians and so on to, to talk to these children and so we're going to be talking about some of the results from that research as we're at the preliminary to preparing a, a final report and then to build the resources based on what we have discovered in those in those interviews. So just as a sneaky preview, some of the results that we're seeing are in particular, the things that have really struck us are incredibly complex and violent environment that many of these children grow up in. So things that just sound astonishing to us, for example, the very typical scenario of an accusation and of a, and of a violent response to an accusation happening within a family. So in the very place where a child should be most loved and protected, that is the number one place where an accusation will start and where the violence can happen, and up to including killing the child. And that's a shocking thing to, to discover. But the children live in, in an environment where violence is normal as well. They live in an environment where there's kidnap, where there's rape, where there's violence, fighting going on around them. Children in places like Goma are living in effectively in a war zone with guerrilla fighting, guerrilla warfare going on there. Huge numbers of children being displaced, the breakdown of family units and those kinds of things all being enormously exacerbating factors that, that make children increasingly at risk. 
And then we've we've also seen uh, some interesting results around dreams, which we it's confirmed things that we had heard about anecdotally before that that there are a lot of beliefs around dream. Uh, if a child, if someone dreams something, someone is a witch, then that means they are a witch. Or if someone has a nightmare, that means that something's happened to them in the night and they are a witch. Or the belief that a spirit person can enter, so a neighbor can take a spirit form and come into your house at night and do things to you, that type of beliefs. Lots of beliefs around food. And the very pernicious impact of the Nigerian film industry in terms of the films that it's produced, which normalize the whole idea that children can be witches and are enormously popular. And people seem to struggle to distinguish between what they've seen on a film and what is real. That is deeply troubling. And it's a very powerful industry in Nigeria. It, it generates enormous amounts of money for the, for the filmmakers. So those are some of the highlights that we've picked out so far, and we're still in the process of analyzing that research. And the aim will be to produce things like stories and little dramas, song, and that type of teaching, interactive teaching materials that children can use as to open discussion around, around the whole issue of whether people, whether a child is or is not a witch. I am so excited to hear about this. When we started talking to advocates a couple of years ago, all of, all of this has been education for me. And we're, with our podcast, we're reaching adults, young mm -hmm. adults, old adults, but in general mm -hmm. adults. And there, when you're looking at the podcast choices, children's podcasts or children's podcasts, and the ones that aren't for children are, and I remember I'm like, man, I just want to do both. I want to have something for kids as well to, but it's all the things that you grapple with that you mentioned the delicacy of it. And so I'm really excited to see mm -hmm. you put together something for children and the, what you hear at the end of that when you talked about the types of materials. I'm just really excited about that. So thank you for working on that. I, the other piece that I really get excited about with your work and your perspective is you have this like local community focused work, but there's a purpose for this global connection and there's what other communities can learn mm -hmm. from other communities is super valuable. How does that stuff meet? That's where things like the Lancaster Conference have been so helpful. We work quite a lot with the team in Papua New Guinea and with Miranda Forsyth and, and Philip Gibbs in Papua New Guinea. We've spoken a lot to them and shared resources, shared approaches. Miranda is particularly interested in the whole idea of contagion, of positive, positive change. So I'm just in the process of, of producing something around the synergies in Goma for her, which they might be able to replicate in some way in Papua New Guinea. And they have produced a, an amazing, wonderful children's film and, and associated materials that go with that, some coloring materials and some materials for teachers to use in schools. And we're learning from them as well. So it's, there's a lot of sharing of ideas and approach. Um, so we find that if people approach us and say, well, how, are you, how do you do that? Or what do you do about this situation? Um, and we've got any, if we've got anything that we've learned, we're more than happy to share that. Our resources are all free to download from our website. We're not interested in any kind of commercialization of anything that we're doing. We just want to get things out there so that they can be used. We've produced some radio dramas and various bits and pieces like that, but they're in limited number of languages at the moment. And um, we just want people to have those resources. And we want to, we've also, we want to learn from other people's research, other people's learning. So we have, we do and spend a lot of time, particularly with the reading material from the Henry Center in America, where there's been a lot of research and that they've got a that their website hosts a lot of research papers and other documentation that's been produced around this topic. And that's super interesting and, and, and so helpful. And it's just when it's sometimes something you hear from somebody else, that's one of the reasons why, as I said, Lancaster is so helpful, where someone will 
say something there and it, it can be like a penny dropping and you say, hang on, that could work in this context too. And, or maybe we could take that idea and, and adapt it in some way. And then obviously we work with our local partners to make sure that everything that we produce is contextualized and is appropriate and resonates in the context where it's being used and doesn't sound like Western thinking and Western um, ideas. So yeah, absolutely. It's so important to be sharing what we are learning. Um, I don't think, I don't, I can't think of a type of subject area where that is more important than, than harm to children. This is some harm. And if, if people are being hurt, then all of us need to do whatever we can to, to share any learning or any insights that we might have that could be used to stop. Uh, harm to one is a harm to all. Exactly. So, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. I feel very hopeful hearing about all these developments and just what we've witnessed also with the international network against mm -hmm. accusations of witchcraft and associated harmful practices mm -hmm. um, and the International Alliance to End Witch Hunts uh, yeah. run by Govan Kelker. Uh, mm -hmm. Just all this interconnectivity, uh, ex comparing experiences and, mm -hmm. and ideas uh, yeah. just really makes me feel a lot of hope for the future. Yeah. It's one huge advantage we have of being in, the, in this century that we're in, that we're, it's much easier to be connected in that kind of international way and then it, it rather than the way it has been in historically in the past where that's been far harder love getting on all these zoom calls that happen mm -hmm. and everybody's just sharing what they've experienced and witnessed yeah so. absolutely yeah. are you finding with the areas that are in crisis with accusations are some, it's a new problem or in, are some an old problem? I'm recognizing recently that it's a new problem in a lot of areas, but as we know, overall across humanity, it's a very old problem. Mm -hmm. I can only talk about the areas where we have some experience, which is the sub-Saharan African context. I know it's different in different parts of the world. I would say that but witchcraft beliefs are as old as time and people and, and the sort of thinking about the, how to explain life, uh, the, the drive to explain life, both good and bad, that's as old as time too. And I would be very surprised if witchcraft accusations haven't happened for, for centuries ev everywhere, pretty much. But the phenomenon of accusing children is a much more recent one in the areas where we're working. So most people are, t are measuring it from about 25, 30 years ago. That's when it started to become far more common for children to be accused. Now, no doubt that there have been exceptions to that and, people, and children have been accused before, but it's not been recognized. But as a, a thing, a phenomenon, it's definitely something that is more recent. And one of the things that is spreading that is, is the Nollywood films. One of the things is, is the changing perceptions of children around children, particularly children who are armed in some way. So child soldiers, children who are on the streets and in violent gangs, that kind of thing, where people's attitudes towards children have become far more hostile. And so that is those things that they, there's, there's a whole load of things that have been identified by people in research uh, projects from the United Nations and elsewhere, things like urban to rural, uh, rural to urban migration poverty, the scale of poverty, the aspirations that people have, which they didn't used to have. So when now that we are so connected, people know what they don't have and, and that can create, that can drive accusations. People believe that they would accuse someone in a community of who is better off than they are of being a witch in order to deprive them of what they have. The property rights of women can make them very vulnerable. So if someone accuses a woman of being a, a widow in particular of being accused, uh, is accused of being a witch, then quite often that will result in the confiscation of her property. So there's a whole load of things that have happened that are more, more recent that have exacerbated the problem. But I suspect that the roots of it go back to time immemorial. Yeah. And one common thread that we've seen through all we've had interviews with historians about the mm -hmm. 
witch trials of the past. And we've yeah. talked to advocates about the recent witch trials. And yeah. one thing that runs through it, of course, is this very real, sincere fear of witchcraft. Yeah. And I think that's something that people miss when they're looking for explanations of why witch hunts happen, mm -hmm. especially looking when people try to explain Salem, they look yeah. at all these external factors, but that yeah. fear yeah. was such a big part of it. And that's yeah. still there today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think fear is probably the number one driver of this whole issue. There are, it's more complicated than that in that sometimes there is a financial gain to be had and there are other drivers as well. Where societies are, there's unrest and displacement or it becomes unsettled. That seems to exacerbate the problem. So things like COVID has made it worse. Thinking historically in the UK, there was a surge in accusations when there was a change from common lands to enclosures. So when land started to be parceled off to belong to specific people rather than being available to whole communities, that drove, create, created a major, it impoverished a large part of the community and that then drove accusations as well. And there's, it, yeah, there's, it, there are, I agree with you completely though, that the fear and the sincerity of the fear is something that has to be understood in order to, to, to develop an appropriate uh, response. And it's why simply telling people not to do something isn't going to get you anywhere. I have a biblical question here. When it comes to fear of mm -hmm. evil, yeah. witchcraft, you don't want to touch it. You don't want to invite it in. You don't want to give it a foothold. How do you overcome that barrier? How do you get people to go and see, there isn't evil here. Here is a child. Yeah. We actually go from it from the other end, so to speak. So what we do is we talk about the fact that there is no fear, no need to be afraid because of what Jesus achieved on the cross, which meant, and the Bible is really clear, there is no evil power or other power greater than God or greater than, than, than Jesus. And, um, and therefore, if we're Christians, we have nothing to fear because our God is greater than um, any form of evil. And then we look specifically at how Jesus um, treated children and adults, but specifically children who were perceived as being demonically possessed and how that his example is gentle, it's compassionate. It never results in ostracism of the child. It results in the child being welcomed into the community or the, or the adult if it's an adult that, that he never re refuses to touch someone who's supposedly possessed he will he holds out his hand to to lift a child up when he's dealt with the the evil that's around the child and it's all very calm and very authoritative and uh, he simply speaks and that's all there's no rit rituals no shaking children no swinging people around no potions, no nothing, and that it's just a normal part of his everyday ministry in, in making sure that people are whole in every way, so physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, in every other way. And we find that when people, when you present that, things from that perspective, so looking first of all, at there is nothing to fear, we do not need to be afraid. And then secondly, and look what happens. Yes, we acknowledge that there is evil in the world, but look, look, look at how Jesus treated the children. And it's very difficult. And then we say, okay, so this is how Jesus did it. How do we deal with this in our community? Is it the same? And that's a very strong contrast quite often. When Jesus deals with it, it's gentle, it's compassionate, it's kind, it, it doesn't involve rituals and so on. In the community, it may be aggressive, ostracizing violent and, and various other things that are a million light years removed from that. And that is, a, a, if you put that up it's two, to two ways side by side, so on this piece of paper, this is how Jesus did it. On this piece of paper, this is how it happens in our community. Is that what we want? And people will very often go, no, we want it to be like the gentle way. We want things to be gentle. We want children to be valued. We want children to be protected. And that's the thread that runs through the training resources.
So, and, and then we've also produced resources around health issues, which are sometimes misunderstood. So things like dementia, things like epilepsy, where people, things like postnatal depression or anxiety, where people's medical conditions are misunderstood and re results in fear of what's going on in that person. And talking about how should we be dealing with people with, with these conditions and with these sicknesses, what do we, what should we be doing and, and how that should be about loving and caring and accepting and nurturing and, and keeping people safe and protecting well and so on. And we find that that approach works pretty well on the whole. <laughs> yeah, it's all great. I've just, I've really enjoyed hearing about this. I think it's important for listeners to hear about this and viewers to see what's going on out there and what's being done about it, that there is positive change occurring. It's a very big, scary problem, but bit by bit, location by location, these changes are happening. Yeah. And the fantastic news is that people are talking about it now and that got, bringing things into the light has always got to be the best way. Yeah. So it's, you can look at them properly and talk about them and examine. Yes. If anybody is interested in the materials that we've produced, they are downloadable from our website, which is stop-cwa.org. And if you look at the resources section on there, there's also research papers and other information on there, if that's helpful for people. Or we can be contacted at info at stop-cwa.org if anyone has any direct questions that they want to talk to us about. And how can our audience support Stop Child Witch Accusations? Again, through our website, there's a donation facility or contact us by email and then we'd be more than happy to receive any donations that are offered. The work we do is on a shoestring because everybody who works with us is voluntary. And, we, and the more resourcing we have, the more communities we can in. So that would be great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a remarkable conversation. I've learned so much from talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. And now Sarah has this week's edition of End Witch Hunts News. Thanks for staying on for our End Witch Hunts News update. The Catholic Church in Papua New Guinea takes a stand against sorcery-related violence. In Papua New Guinea, the Catholic Church has become a vocal force in the fight against violence stemming from sorcery accusations, an issue disproportionately affecting women, especially widows, single mothers, and other persons without support systems. Mavis Tito, the National Director of Caritas Papua New Guinea, recently shared how sorcery accusation-related violence, or SARV, has been escalating due to unemployment, substance abuse, and the lack of basic services in many communities. Women who are accused are often targeted left defenseless, and rejected by their families. To learn more specifically on SARV, please tune in to our previous podcast episode with Miranda Forsyth. One major initiative combating SARV comes from the Diocese of Wabeg, where Auxiliary Bishop Justin Ain Sunji has organized young men to speak out against these violent acts in their communities. This approach has already shown promising results, with reports of SARV decreasing in certain areas. During his very recent visit to Papua New Guinea, Pope Francis called on the Catholic Church to stand by abused and marginalized women, particularly those falsely accused of sorcery. He highlighted the urgency of addressing violence against women in a country where women have experienced physical or sexual violence more than double the global average. Allegations of sorcery frequently lead to extreme harm, with women facing deadly consequences. The Pope's message was clear. We must respond with closeness, compassion, and tenderness. There is still much work to be done to protect women from the dangers of sorcery accusations in Papua New Guinea and in every corner of the world. Here at End Witch Hunts, we are inspired by these efforts and the efforts of many more, and will continue to raise awareness and support. To learn more, visit us at endwitchhunts.org. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Witch Hunt. 
We'll see you next week. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow.